we had been in 1 John for five or six weeks, but I'm going back to where we were when the pandemic hit, to Leviticus. We had done six lessons in Leviticus. I want to go back there. I want to talk about the offerings. Man, I've been reading and studying all these things. They just kind of blow my mind. But so this is Leviticus part 7. And, and we're just going to look at the offerings a little bit today. Uh, the different types. And, and this is so... All the things that we've been talking about, if we can, if we can understand... A little bit of these offerings. We know they're all fulfilled. They're all satisfied in Christ Jesus. But I was just looking. You realize that every book of the Bible is written by a Hebrew. And a Hebrew who understood Passover, Pentecost, Feast of First Fruits, uh, Day of Atonement. Who understood the tabernacle and the priesthood and the garments of the priesthood. And, and the two turtle doves and the, the meal offerings and the sin offering, trespass offering. And when you see that. When you begin to understand that, you see their writings in Romans and 1 Peter and 1 John is full of it. It's where they got the stuff. And so I want to go back and look. And plus, if the Holy Spirit gave us this book, which I believe he did, it's very important. He didn't say, okay, well, uh, we're in New Covenant now. Throw Leviticus out. We don't need it anymore. Uh, they spoke of the scriptures, which was the old covenant. They were writing the new. So these, these offerings, uh, there's two sections in these offerings. We'll get into the physicality of the offerings next week. But they were, uh, the first one was a sweet savor offering. And I just hear Paul, a sweet smelling savor unto Jesus, or uh, under our Father. A sweet smelling savor into Christ. Where did he get that from? He got that from these offerings right here. And, and so this, this sweet savor offerings is all voluntary. Like we were talking about. Or voluntary. There's a free will offering. So an Israelite, he would, he would bring them out of the sheer overflow of his heart. A sweet savor out of the overflow of his heart. I, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking... Wow, a set up from the beginning because the, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts and he, he works in us both the will and do of his good pleasure. Uh, so this is how the sheer overflow of his heart. He, he, this Israelite, he loved God, he walked with God and, and voluntarily he expressed that to God in the sweet savor offerings. Now the non-sweet savor offerings, they were demanded offerings required, if you will. If a man sinned, it wasn't a choice to bring an offering. You better bring that offering or you're excommunicated, put out of the camp. And a sin offering was one of non-sweet savor. Uh, they were demanded offerings. And we'll, we'll see all of that fulfilled in Christ as we go through. But I, I want to go back to where we were and just rehash something because this, you know, all of these have to do with blood. And, you know, talking to a friend of mine today, and he's talking about this other guy, and this other guy is always in condemnation. He's always in condemnation. And he just doesn't feel like he's good enough. You, you know what I mean? And, you know, this isn't some new thing. I mean, this is what the devil's been doing to us since the garden. And so all of these offerings dealt with all of those feelings, all those emotions, all those actions, how I relate to God, how God relates to me. Everything is summed up in these offerings. So in, in these offerings, just, just going back so that we can understand, there's always the shedding of blood because the life was in the blood. And just to rehash how these went. Now remember the sweet savor offerings and the non-sweet savor offerings. Uh, but they all dealt with blood. So when, when the blood was shed, and we're going to look at this as we go through, there's many things that are done with the blood. Man, there's so much detail the Holy Spirit gives us. The way it was sprinkled, poured on this corner, on that corner, here or there. Um, 
we'll see as we come to these offered. But but once the the death had occurred in the shedding of the blood of the animal, we're talking of the animal. The blood was caught, uh, caught in a basin, and and then the blood gushing out of that of the lamb or goat or bull or whatever it was, uh, the life was released. Okay, and in that one act, the life of that animal had been forfeited, right? It, it, it had been forfeited, and immediately it, it was true to say that your sin had been paid for. Because the wages of sin is death. Okay? And the gushing out of that blood was the death of the ass of boom. Sin is paid for. Um, as soon as that blood was shed, you see, because the sin had been laid on that animal. You know, we, we had come and we had put our hands on the animal and confessed our sins. And which in symbol, and all of this was symbol, type, and shadow the blood of that animal had now become polluted because the animal's blood had, had become polluted with the sin of the offerer. But once the death had occurred and the life had been released, uh, that sin that it once bore, the animal bore it, it bears it no more. It had been taken away. Now we know, of course, that the blood of the animal could not take away sin it merely covered it. And that's a big difference. It covered sin. That word is atonement. You know, that's pulling the rug back, sweeping the dirt under the rug. Perpetuation means I pulled the rug back and we've completely cleaned it away as far as the east is from the west. So in that old, old way, all they could do was atone for it, awaiting for the day of the final offering. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. So what happened to the blood? It was taken and sprinkled before the Lord, uh, again in various ways. And it was as if the blood was speaking. You remember Abel's blood cries from the ground. The idea was that wherever the blood has gone, I can now go. I can now go. For the life of the animal was my life, and it had been forfeited. The wages of sin had been paid for and now I could go there. My sin had been taken away. Where the blood goes, I go. Now you can see why Paul would say, let us come boldly to the throne of grace to seek mercy. I mean, where did he get that? He got that right out of the tabernacle and the offerings. And he knew that high priest carried it. He knew Jesus was our high priest. And by his own blood, uh, by a new and living way, uh, Consecrated through the veil. It meant I could, uh, when the high priest took that blood behind the veil to, to go and sprinkle it there, it meant that I could go there. I could go there in praise. I could go there in worship. Where the blood is gone, I could go. And, and here's, here's a point. Wherever there was blood, man now had a legal right to stand in God's presence. Legally. To stand in God's prayer. I mean, we look at terms like righteousness, justice, judgment. I mean, these are legal terms. Legally, you can stand there. And uh, to give you this one verse here in uh, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now Peter wrote that. He's, he's right to these people, but see, they would understand that you, you might obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. The meaning was that because he, the one whose life was the most absolute and final uh, since yielded up to the Father on our behalf that when he went into the very holiest of all it was as if we went right in there with him. Paul would say we're seated with him in the heavenly places. Because his life was released in the shedding of his blood 
was enough to propitiate or satisfy forever the justice of God against my sin. Forever, once and for all. And when the Holy Spirit brings to me that work and applies it to me, the result of a shed blood, that's the sprinkling of the blood on me. And that's the, that's the point. You know, this, this one guy, he's always living in condemnation. I mean, and this is Peter's prayer right here. Through the sanctification of the Spirit, that the Spirit may work in you the sprinkling, this, this, this very thing, because this is the only thing that's going to take away the condemnation. And we can say all of these other things, but if we don't understand these offerings once and for all, man, uh, it gets used against it. They overcame him. How do you overcome the, the condemnation? They overcame him, the accuser, by the blood of the Lamb. Now, what blood is he talking about? Huh? He, when we're going to get right down bare bones to it, there's the, the sweet savor offerings, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking the sin offering and the trespass offering. If I can't see that, man, I, I can't even approach the sweet savor offerings because I'm going to be in condemnation. How can you praise and, and when you're in condemnation? So you have got to, to get a hold of these offerings. These sweet savor offerings. So the first one of these uh, sweet savor offerings was the burn offering. And I have got to get us some, some pictures so I can uh, show you guys. But, you know, there was a burn offering that was on the altar at all times. And they put it on there at 6 a.m. They put it on there at 6 p.m. The next morning at 6 a.m. The next morning at 6 p.m. Every single day. There was a burn offering on that altar. But then we could bring a burn offering also. Remember, it was voluntary out of the overflow of our heart. We could also bring an offering. Now, this altar, remember we talked about how big this altar was. It wasn't a little altar. This thing was huge. And so I mean, there was plenty of room. But you could bring this burn offering. So what did it mean to the Israelite as he was coming to bring his burnt offering. It, it, it meant that voluntarily he was devoting everything to God. And he symbolized that by the purifying with fire. In other words, it's wholly burnt. Everything of it is burnt on the altar. Everything is burnt on the altar. So what does the burnt offering mean concerning Christ? It, because I know the first thing, you know, that we do, we, we hear it with our minds. We're like, I'm going to give everything to God. I'm going to, I'm going to give my whole, it's like, well, wait a minute. This is fulfilled in Christ. Just relax a minute. So what did it mean concerning Christ? It meant that Christ was going to present himself to the Father in totality to do the Father's will. Remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Not my will, but thine be done. He said, not even the words that I speak. The words that I speak, they're not even mine. My, my, I come to do the will of him that sent me. In totality. I mean, he's a living burnt offering. So what does that mean to me, the, the Christian, the, the believer, who, who looks back at this one finished offering of, of Christ? It, it means that... that that me, it means that you, with, with all that we are, with all that I am and, and possess, walk through life as his total possession through the one offering of Jesus Christ. I'm his through the one offering of Jesus Christ. Now that burnt offering, again, it's just always remember the burnt offering was a sweet savor. Sweet savor unto God. It was a sweet savor offering. And, and, you know, when the Israelite brought it, it meant you, you voluntarily gave yourself away to God. Now, we know Jesus uh, is the f final fulfillment was how he totally gave himself to do the Father's will. And when we identify ourselves with what Jesus did, then we are no longer our own. We're bought with a price. And we totally do God's will. Now, boy, there's a statement. What do you mean we totally do God's will? Well, listen, everything I just told you 
Now remember our lessons in 1 John about doing God's will and about keeping his commandments and where all that led. Now listen to what Paul says here in Romans. A sweet savor offering, a burnt offering. Romans chapter 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now remember, every time I see that word mercies, remember Paul is a Hebrew, a covenant guy. So I can say, I, 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 brethren, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the covenant loyalty, by the covenant loving kindness of God. To me, that sounds much more loving than the mercies of God, the way we say it in America. But I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the covenant loving kindness of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual worship. Where would Paul get this? Just something like made it. He got it from the burnt offering. And not only that, but the sacrifice of praise offering, you'll see here in a minute. And he says, which is acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, your spiritual worship. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, don't give yourself to the world. Right here is where, where you are, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Okay, so now I'm thinking, okay, I've got to prove what is the will of God. Well, Paul didn't stop writing there. He just kept right on. For I say, through grace given to me, this is how I'm going to speak to you. I'm speaking to you through the grace, through the covenant loyalties of God. To every man that is among you, don't think more highly of yourself. Don't get exalted. I mean, you thought, that, oh, look how much I give myself to God. No, wait just a second here, guys. This is through the swan offering. But as to think soberly, calm your minds down, slow down a little bit. According as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Boy, we could go right back to Romans 5 and really go into that, but I won't. About proving what is the perfect will of God. What is that? Prove it. So, so what is it? So we go through these gifts, different one from another. We've got ministry and prophecy and we, we got all of these other things. I'm going to start in verse 8. Or he that exhorteth, that word means encourage. He that encourages on encouragement. He that gives, let him do it with simplicity. He that rules with diligence. He that shows, here's that word mercy. He that shows covenant loyalty. He that shows loving kindness with cheerfulness, with joy. Let love be without dissimulation. Be kindly affectionate one to another. With brotherly love. See, and just as John said that we love Jesus, and what else do we do? We love one another. And what is Paul saying? What is the will of God? That we love the Lord and that we love one another. Same, same thing. And we see it right here in the burnt offering. I could go on and on with that, but I, I, wanna, I better get going. Now, the second sweet savor offering was, uh, King James would say, the meal offering. Uh, many translations will call it the cereal offering. It was the grain. And it was uh, an act of praise to God. When, it, when an Israelite offered the cereal offering, he, he praised God and offered his life to God to serve God. It, it spoke of, of servant. Now, again, can you see, and a lot of these offerings were offered together, all right? Can you see what I just read as these offerings, what Paul is reading is these offerings, the burnt offering and the meal offering offered together, which is your reasonable service. Present your bodies as a burnt offering, which is your reasonable service. And he says, cheerfully, with joy, encouraging one another with joy. And, and in, in that, when the Israelite brought, it, brought that meal offering, he said, I give myself to become God's servant, that I may minister on his behalf with the gifts that he's given me. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. There's gifts ministering one to another, that I may minister uh, uh, prophecy, faith, ministry, encouragement, uh, you know, all of these things. I mean, you, that's where Romans 12 is coming right out of these offerings. 
But Mark's gospel, the gospel of Mark, shows Jesus as the cereal offering more than any other gospel. It shows Jesus as the servant, the perfect servant. He was, the, he was the servant of the Father, and not only was he the servant of the Father, he was the servant of all men. He delighted in the title, Son of Man. I mean, and what we've been on talking about Sunday, what does Isaiah 42 say? Behold my servant. When I identify with Jesus in this uh, cereal offering, it, it is that he lives in me. He lives his life inside of me because remember we're talking about service here. And I know what people say is, you know, I know the going words in the church are we got to go serve God. Which I understand what they're talking about, but they have the direction wrong. Okay, Paul says this, that we would walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called. That we might prove that, that good and perfect will of God. That we walk worthy of the vocation where we've been. What have we been called to? And see, that was a question that the guy asked me today. He said, well, this brother's always condemned because he doesn't feel like he's a good preacher. I ain't been called to preach. I said, brother, hey, we ain't called to preach. We're called to love. And, and I mean, isn't that what we're called to? We're called to love. We're called to joy. We're called to peace. Stop worrying about who's up in the pulpit and whether they can break down the house and we're called to love and do it to give cheerfully one, one to another. So that's where we've been called to and we minister those gifts from him, not for him. We minister from him the life of Jesus Christ that is within me. So I'm not, and how, we serve one another. So I just want to get the direction right. It's because people don't understand these things. Now the third and final, <coughs> excuse me, the third and final sweet savor offering is the peace offering. It has another name. It's called the sacrifice of praise. And it was the sacrifice whereby you praise God. I mean, that, that's what it was. In, in this offering of, of, in this peace offering. Now, think about this. You know, because I know what we do. When, when Jesus said, my peace, I'll leave with you. We don't associate this with the, with the offerings at all. We just think peace and all, all of that means everything around me has got to be peaceful. But remember, my, my peace, I'll leave with you. But it's also called the sacrifice of praise. My praise, I'll leave with you. And in that praise is, is joy and cheerfulness and the whole, and that I'll leave with you. Out of, and how do these sweet savers, out of the abundance of the heart, they bring them a full heart. And in, the, and in this offering, this is so good, in this sacrifice of praise offering, you actually participated in fellowship with God because you got to eat part of the offering. The thing that we do every week, you got to eat part of the offering. So it was the sacrifice where I praised God and fellowship with God. And it's fulfilled in Christ in, in that in Christ is where man and God sat down together and have fellowship. You remember I was talking in 1 John about His holiness is compatible. It all met together in Jesus, and that's where we meet God at. No man can come to the Father except through Jesus, and this is a total reflection on the praise on, on this peace offering. Now, I've got to give you a couple verses here to show you this fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, God is faithful. Now, there's that covenant word again. God is, the same word as mercy, God is faithful. God is, is covenant loyal. By whom you were called, now here's this calling again, unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now people want to talk about we have fellowship and we have fellowship. Our fellowship is bound up in the person of Jesus Christ or we have no fellowship. Now, I want to go back to 1 John because we were there for five or six weeks. 1 John chapter 1 
what this letter was about, verse 3, that we which have seen and heard declare we unto you. Remember these Gnostics were coming in with their, Jesus wasn't really a person. And how heretical it was to say Jesus really didn't come in the flesh because if he didn't come in the flesh, then there's no meeting place for God and man to come together. But in the person of Jesus Christ, so we got to get this fellowship squared away. And John's going to tell us, and we declare to you that, that you also may have fellowship with us. I'm telling you guys that you may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. There's where the place where heaven has joined earth in the person of Jesus. And whenever I'm going to praise God, then at the very center of all my praise is going to be the finished work of Jesus Christ. And you can also put in there fellowship with each other because in this sacrifice of praise offering, you never ate it alone. You didn't go home and do it by yourself. You always went and got all the poor, all the needy, everybody that was distressed and up the creek, and you went and gathered them all, and you brought them into your home, and y'all had a blast. Y'all had a party. That's the way you did this offering. Can you see Jesus referencing this? When it, because this would go right in with a wedding. Because, I mean, you remember Jesus, the wedding, and he invites them all there. And then he says, go out by the highways and get the poor and the crippled and the needy and get all of them and bring them in. We're talking about a praise offering here. But they were too busy. But they would have a little house meeting and everybody would be gathered around and they would just have a blast and just sacrifice a praise offering. Because you are in fellowship with God and you and God are eating together. I kind of see this going to my shovel bath. <laughs> you know, I, see, I, I look at these offerings and I, I, I see them just lived out right there in my shovel bath. Well, those are the three sweet savor offerings. The burn offering, the meal offering, and, and the uh, peace offering. There's two more offerings and these are non-sweet savor offerings. Now the one is, and I, I had trouble with the second one, but you'll understand why. The, the first one is the sin offering. Now, remember the first three are voluntary. These are not voluntary. No Israelite would bring this sin offering unless he needed to be forgiven. So he, he's recognized, man, I'm a sinner. Man, there's something basically wrong with me. See, when he brings this sin offering, I want you to get this now. He's not so much concerned at this time with what he's done. He just kind of knows something ain't right. He, he, he didn't bring it because I lost my temper. He just knows, man, I'm an angry person. You know what I mean? I'm a sad person. I'm an angry person. Something's not right with me. So the, the sin offering speaks to who I am, not so much to what I've done. Now that makes sense to who I am because we were in Adam dead in trespasses and sin. But here he is. He needs to be forgiven not for what he's done but who he is. He comes, he comes bringing this offer and he says, man, I need to be changed so, so God help me here. I'm the wrong kind of person. Now how is that fulfilled in Christ Jesus? Remember, he is the propitiation. He is the, the satisfaction for even the guilt of our sin. See, I wish the people who live in condemnation could get that Jesus, because, oh, you know, I'm trying to do this, but I still feel bad about me. Well, if you was an Israelite, you wouldn't brought your sin offering. So now I think, man, I need to introduce to you the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. In other words, he took not sins of the world, not things I do, but the very person I am, he's going to take it away. I mean, today when, when, when I come to see that in the finished work of Christ, my old man was crucified with Christ. My old man was put away. That old person was buried. He's gone. Crucified. 
I, and what do we become? A new person in Christ Jesus. You see, this all has to do with the sin offering, not sin. Sin means there's something wrong about me. And that's what this person can't see. He can't see that, man, this is fulfilled in Christ. And that old man is gone. Now, the second part of this offering is the trespass offering. And it's the final of the non-sweet saver offerings. And, and the, it was the trespass offering that was for individual sins. All the things that I did because I'm the wrong kind of person. And not only sins I did against God, because remember here, we, we not only sinned against God, we were the enemies of God. Not he was our enemy, we were his enemy, meaning we wanted to kill him and take his place. People say, well, that's a little bold. Well, we crucified Jesus. We said we'll not have this man to rule over us. So it, it's, it's, it's those, those sins right there. It, it's the offering that has realization of my uh, societal responsibilities. Because I have a certain responsibility to the man that I've sinned against. Right? I mean, not only took me towards God, but i got to live with this guy that I have wronged. So... In this offering, you realize I've sinned, therefore I just can't get right with God. You remember Jesus told him according to the law, you, you're bringing your offering. Before you bring your offering, you got out with your brother. Go get right with your brother. Now that's old covenant stuff, but you see, we, we've all been reconciled to God through, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because that's what he, when, when Paul said that, he's referring to this trespass offering. That, that we have all been brought, we've all been reconciled. And, and again, don't think too highly of yourself. Paul uses Romans 3, uh, 1, 2, and 3 to show us, hey guys, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So nobody can say, we've all wronged each other and we've all wronged God. So don't think too highly. Who summed this up was Jesus and not in our sacrifice at all. So we had to get it right with, with our fellow man. So this Israelite would bring his trespass offering, but he would also pay back the man that he owed all against. And you remember the law would give us that. You stole the land, you give four back. You, you, you did a certain thing. You, all of those things are in there. So these are why terms would come out like, like justice, where we're going to get justice. Right? Because they would pray for justice because that man sinned against me. He, he killed my son. He, he did whatever. Where am I going to get? Well, see, all of this is summed up in the trespass offering. That, that Jesus has, has done this. He has answered it all. Christ's final offer was not only causing man to be made right with God and that his sin is dealt with, but he also took all of the results of our sins. And what I mean by that is he didn't only deal with the root, the root being who I am, he dealt with the fruit, what I've done. The axe was laid to the root of the tree. And back in 1 John, chapter 1, verse 7 again, it says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. There's that fellowship again. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now that in the King James here, cleanses, the ETH, that means it's continual. That means, because some people have this delusion that we as believers don't sin. Well, remember we talked about in 1 John, we can't practice sin because sin this doesn't seem right to us because we weren't designed to sin. We've got a new heart. The heart that desires to, to love and, and to do good and prove that perfect will of God, which is love. And in the middle of that, in our striving to get along, Christ's blood, this offering is there, and it forever cleanses us from all sin. It's forever cleansing us. It's forever cleansing us. Not only does he deal with the old me as I was, but he keeps on cleansing me. 
from sin. We, there is a fountain opened up in the house of David. So, I want to sum this up here. So, depending on what you wanted, uh, you as an Israelite wanted to say to God. Now, notice, if I wanted to talk to God, remember, He's there. He's up there behind the veil. And I can't get there. So if I want to talk to God, I feel a lot of praise towards God. I bring this, this peace offering. I bring this burnt offering. And, and oh, I just, I'm having a bad day. I don't know why. And I bring this sin offering. And, man, I really wronged this guy over here. And I bring my trespass offering. If I, ever how I'm feeling, ever how I wanted to communicate with God, it's all done through the offering. Right? I couldn't just... Say, hey, high priest, you know, I'm going to go in there behind the veil and, and talk to God. Now remember, no man can come to the Father except through Jesus who is all of these offerings. Who has summed up every emotional thing, sin that I've ever dealt with, who I am. Everything is dealt with right here in these offerings. And, and people, they just overlook Leviticus like it's some stupid book to who cares about all this other stuff. But... You come over here to the New Testament, you don't see it. Uh, these Israelites lived this thing 1,500 years every day watching this blood flow, and they knew what it was. They just couldn't see it fulfilled in Jesus. So these Israelites, depending on what they wanted to say to God, would choose their offering specifically to what they wanted to say. I... Uh, I was listening to this thing there earlier today uh, to Dolly Parton. She was talking about writing songs, and she said that's her, when I want to express how I feel, I write a song. And you know, a lot of poets, they do that. And David, he did that. But what he's saying, you know, I don't have to be poetic. If I want to talk to God, it's summed up in Jesus Christ. If I want to have fellowship with God, it's in Jesus Christ. If I want to praise God, it's in Jesus Christ. If I want to worship, it's in Jesus Christ. If I'm having a bad day, it's in Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, you see, I mean, they could say it once and for all in Christ. All the conversations the Israelites had, they went through, they went through the offerings. Now, I, I want you to think about this. All the conversations that they would have with God. The only way they could speak would be through the blood offerings, through the sacrifices of God, all their prayers. They couldn't pray. They couldn't go in there to that altar of incense and pray unless blood had been sprinkled on it. You know what I mean? Because I can't go there until the blood's there. So what does that say? Why do you think Jesus would come and say, in that day, you'll know anything you ask in my name in that blood, because you have a legal right to ask now because of what he's done. It wasn't just a tagline to say at the end of a prayer. It's understanding you got a legal right to be there. The blood has already been shed. And you can come boldly and ask anything because of these offerings. They're so important. So important. Ask anything in his name through this blood. And all of that was done for you in Christ. And we can take it as our own. What's he say? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Now let me give you just a couple verses here. Man, I could, I could go on and on. Hebrews. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Let me just start verse 12. But this man... Talking about Jesus. Now, Hebrews right here in, in chapter 10, we, we, we went through the Old Testament sacrifices and the sprinkling of blood and all of these things and doing away with the first and here the second. And then he says, but this man, he's talking about Jesus. After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now, why do I keep going back to this? Because people, listen, people who live in condemnation, why, why would you live in condemnation? Only one reason, sin. Because you don't really believe sin has been dealt with. You believe sin has partially been dealt with. But this is a big deal. 
Now, a lot of people, they don't like to talk about sin anymore. Don't like to talk about it being dealt with. We're like, we want to get a breakthrough. But most people haven't got this. You can't begin to get your breakthrough until you understand sin has been dealt with once and for all. It's over. It's gone. It's done. If we're still living in condemnation, if we're still flopping around, you ain't got this offering down. You can't go nowhere until this is dealt with. I mean, you, you know you know what I mean. You're going nowhere until you get this right. This is 1,500 years of practice they had doing the sin offering, this trespass offering. Still yet today, 2,000 years later, we ain't got it right. But here it is. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Now, you got a legal right. Paul says you seated with him in heavenly places. From henceforth expecting, hoping, expecting, till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, by one offering, that offering of himself, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified or set apart. Whereof the Holy Ghost is a witness to us. There's your witness. And you remember John said that he gave the testimony, deposited his testimony in us, the very witness himself, who does what? Testifies of Jesus. He will, I will send you the comforter, he will testify of me. I write you these things that you might know. Whereof the Holy Ghost is a witness to us. For after that he had said this before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Said the Lord, not us. Remember, we were talking Sunday. I didn't. I didn't negotiate these terms. I didn't sit down at the table and say, "Here's what I propose. Here's what you propose." The Lord says, "I'm making the covenant. Here's the terms of it. Accept it or leave it. Here's the terms. I will put my laws in their heart and in their minds while I write them, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more." There's the terms of the new covenant. Take it or leave it. No negotiating. I love that. And, and he says, now where remission there is, there's no more offering for sin. Don't need to be. It's over. Remission. I don't need to go to the doctor when my cancer's in remission. It's, it, you know what I mean? It's gone. I don't have to go back and keep taking treatments. It's over with. I'm, I'm cured, clean. Having therefore, brethren, boldness. That word is confidence. To enter into the holiest. How? By the blood of Jesus. Because the blood is there. The blood has been applied. And now I can come in. How? By a new and living way. Not a dead way. Not a dead way. Because he died on the cross and shed his blood. And that blood, I don't know how we'll get that. was called the basin. And Jesus offered himself as a living sacrifice. And when he did that, he got up and told Mary, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended into my God and your God, my Father and your Father. He's taking that blood and consecrating a new one. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the life. And he says, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. What kind of true heart? A heart that has the love of God shed abroad in it. A true heart. Finally, we have a true heart that is obedient unto God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled, man, Peter said the same thing, and sprinkled, having your, let the Holy Spirit work this work in you, hearts speak, sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful. That promise. Let me give you one more. Man, that's too good to quit on. Romans. Romans chapter 4, and we'll, we'll quit right here, I promise. Verse 25. Again, keep in mind these offerings. Who was delivered for our offenses? Remember trespass offering. He was delivered for our offenses. Ah, but he was raised again for our justification. 
Therefore, because he was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification, because of that, be justified by faith. In other words, I've received that he did it. That's my faith. My faith is he did it. I'm trusting in him. He did it. He said my sins are no more. That's it. Terms of the covenant, I, I, I accept it. We have peace with God. Now, now see, because of these one offerings, now I'm brought right back into the peace offering. And you remember this peace offering? This peace offering that had to do with fellowship. It had to do with fellowship. And, and, and I can't have fellowship if I don't have peace. And if I'm sitting at the table and God is sitting at the table and if we're sitting in Christ Jesus at the table, taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and he's, when he says bring in the poor and needy, guess who that is? Me and you. <laughs> Me and you brought us into the table and he's glad that we're there. And what did he say when he brought the sheep back? Tell everybody. My, my sheep I was lost. Now I'm found. And we're going to have a celebration. And when the woman lost the coin, well, I tell everybody, man, he's found. This is a peace offering. We have peace with God. How? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. By whom? By the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, not only that, also, we have access by faith and to this grace, right, right, to this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope and the expectation of the glory of God. Let me just give you a couple more because he's, he hasn't stopped right here. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. What do you mean with glory in tribulation? That sounds stupid, doesn't it? Paul said, you know what? I've learned to glory in my infirmities. Because in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. In other words, I learned to glory in that I bring nothing to this. As a matter of fact, salvation with men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So I learned to glory in that I bring nothing to this. And it took tribulation for me to figure that out. And also knowing that tribulation works patience. I can wait upon the Lord. I very talk from Sunday. And patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope maketh not ashamed. In other words, what we were talking about in Hebrews, let us draw near. If I'm ashamed, I'm drawing back. I'm going back in condemnation saying, no, no, no. But hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. By the Holy Ghost, which he's given unto us. Man. But, verse 8. But God commendeth his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My goodness. So that's the offerings. And I'll quit right there, but we'll keep on going next week. Oh,